So my title for this talk is I Dare You To Be Great. And this is born of me daring myself to be great. Uh, what does that mean? Well, for me, uh, this is something we're exploring in the course as well. For me, this is very much about being in service to something bigger than the self. But it's not that simple. I discovered that just daring to be great doesn't mean that by Thursday I'm suddenly magically great. It doesn't quite work out like that in the world. But it, it's kind of strange because I, it was one of these thoughts that came to me when I asked a big question, and I tend to do this in my life. I, I really love the, the art of the powerful question, I call it. You know, actually finding questions that I don't know the answers to. <coughs> It, it elicits a, a, a process of deeper inquiry and it invites in from the most unusual corners and acquaintances all the assistance that I need to actually get to the answer. And the, the whole idea of daring to be great actually came from a very simple question I asked myself. It was a year and a half ago on my birthday on the 4th of July. And I asked myself, well, you know, after I've sorted out a law of ecocide and I've done that permaculture course I always wanted to do, what's next? <laughs> and I thought, you know, something would come back, maybe a job spec or something, but, but it didn't, it didn't. What came back was dare to be great. And it was one of these things where you go, oh, oh wow. I don't know about that one. That, that's, that's, that's a bit big. I thought Law of Ecocide was a bit of a big idea, but Dare to be Great? Where does that fit into things? And I actually parked the idea. I thought, okay, that's one to deal with at a later date. And it was kind of like the, the small voice in me came out and said, you know, who are you to dare to be great? What, you know, this, this is something that can come later in life. You know, once you've sorted so much more out and once you've maybe grown up a bit, because I, I keep on having this thing of what am I going to do when I grow up? I just haven't quite grown up. <laughs> and, and I've got a very good friend and we, you know, each time we see each other, we say, have you worked out what you're going to do when you grow up yet? No, no, no. Um, still having fun. Yeah, OK. You know, maybe we're not meant to grow up. And so daring to be great seemed like a very grown up thing to do. I, it kind of talked of something so much bigger. And does that mean that I, you know, I can't be naughty? And what does it mean to be naughty? Oh my goodness, you know, you end up getting tied up with a whole load of issues. This is a problem when you get ethical. Life gets complicated, you know. Uh, it's dead easy when you don't have, you know, ethics <laughs> flying around your head to ask questions of yourself. But I kind of got outed. I, I outed myself, if you like. I, when I was giving a TED talk, in fact, Charles was there a, in Whitechapel. It was organised actually by a, an, a former student of Schumacher, a very dear friend, Amrita, and some others. And they organised this most wonderful of TED talks. And it was very much, I got a, a huge sense at this group of wonderful people speaking there, that we were really stepping into the new world. All who were there very much spoke from that place. Satish was there, Mac from Embercombe, many others as well, Graham Hancock. Uh, it was very good fun. And I had this talk prepared to talk about a law of ecocide. And I found myself with the devil and the angel playing out on my shoulders two minutes before I was to speak. Um, and I don't know even now if it was the devil or the angel saying to me, ditch the talk, just get rid of the talk, ditch the talk, don't talk about a law of ecocide, talk about dare to be great. And the other side going, no, 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 that's a very bad idea. This is going to get you out of your comfort zone. And it, it was a real battle going on. And I was literally kind of sitting there going, oh, oh no, no, what am I going to do here? And I realised that, oh, Heck, if I can't do it with the people th that are really the people I care about here, where and when can I do this? You know? And I think something happens when we kind of take the step into the unknown, the quantum leap, when we get, get to the edge of our comfort zone and we say, okay, I don't know what I'm going to say, I'll just 
put trust in the process and I'll step out there and see what happens. And, you know, magic does happen in those circumstances. I, and actually it was kind of weird because it, it was almost as if the circumstances were prompting me into that moment. I actually overheard you, Charles, behind me saying to someone, you know, I, I don't do PowerPoint, you know, I just get up and talk. And I've kind of got into that stage. I had pretty much got into that stage myself of thinking, you know, PowerPoint is a bit powerless and pointless, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you kind of gave me permission to ditch the PowerPoint there and then. And I haven't actually ever used the PowerPoint since then. So it's all your fault. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's, there was something about going public about this big idea. And I found myself realising, oh, OK, you know, I'm not allowed to park that, really. I mean, yeah, I had a choice. I could have just stayed in my comfort zone. But I didn't. I, I stepped out. And we did, we did a great kind of process yesterday. Uh, so, um, you know, I now have a group of people who are, who are now going to possibly experience the sort of stuff that I ended up experiencing. Because something happens in that moment. You, you're actually, you know, giving it intent and you're making it visible, you know, by, it, it becomes spoken. You're taking something that's up here and it's coming out here and it's, it's heard, it's witnessed. And something changes in that moment. You're, energetically, something's been sent out into the world and it invites in all the circumstances to challenge you to meet it. Uh, and that's the thing. I think, you know, I find life kind of works like Groundhog Day. You know, <coughs> if, if it doesn't happen then, it'll come boomerang back in here and, you know, again and again and again until you meet that moment. So, what does it mean? For me, it, dare to be great is very much, I, I have such a greater sense that there's something greater than me at play here. I'm absolutely convinced that there's something greater at play here. What precisely it is, I don't know. I can, I, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to kind of identify, put words to it, what exactly is playing out here. But whatever it is, it's very exciting. And I really kind of feel that there's, there's such huge, you know, it's the realm of potential here. There's such huge potential for change. And for me, working with earth law and the law of ecocide, I'm very conscious that the earth is calling upon us. It's an invitation, if you like, to step up and participate, be a participant in life. It's not to sit back and be an observer. Well, you can if you like, but life just kind of throws everything at you and you're buffeted, you know, uh, like being in some little boat in the high seas and the storms from one end to the other and a lot of seasickness in between. But there's something about taking up the invitation, taking up the call. And I was really kind of curious about this, you know, what is it in me that's really driving me? Because I know that it's something that's so intrinsic within me to get up and get out there and speak about earth law and decoside and so on and so forth. And it really helped me when I met a guy from Germany who's, he's actually, he's researching people who have huge courage. And, and I'm really talking about courage in a way that I don't know that I'd ever have. But he talked about uh, people who had done the most remarkable things in their lives. People that, many that you haven't ever heard of. Um, some you may have done. Sophie Scholl, I don't know if any of you have heard of Sophie Scholl. Sophie Scholl is one of my great all-time heroines who stood up in the face of Nazism and really spoke out to the effect that, well, it, it, it cost her her life for doing that. But also other people as well. I, he told me a wonderful story about a man who was on, uh, standing at the subway station, uh, the underground subway station or a train station in New York, and a train was hurtling in. Here was this young man standing there. He had two young daughters, one in each hand. And the gentleman beside him had an epileptic fit and fell onto the, the railway line as this train was hurtling in. 
And he immediately turned round, handed his children over to a stranger and leapt on down on top of the man and rolled him off the line in between the railings right at the moment as the train came whoosh, right over them. <laughs> he just saved this man's life within a hair's breadth of a second. And this man didn't even know it. And in fact, it took them, I think, 40 minutes until they could move the train to get them out. And you can imagine the conversation with this man when he came to after having his epileptic fit to discover someone on top of him and a train on top of that to be told, uh, you're OK, you, you're all right. But I, I spoke to this, this young professor, German professor. He was examining these great acts of courage. And I was saying, you know, what is this common denominator? What makes people stand up and step out in moments where, you know, many others wouldn't do that? What is it that's going on here? And what is it that sometimes drives people far further? You know, I'm trying to make sense of my own self here. And he said, well, Polly, it's exactly what you're doing. It, it, you know, look at the language. It's the language of necessity. If I ask you, why are you doing it? You'll say, well, I have to. Now, I don't know if I'd have the courage to actually go and jump onto those railway tracks. I've no idea. Um, or Sophie Scholl, you know, um, with her huge courage that she had to stand up and speak out about Nazism. You know, my life is far safer than that. But it is certainly that common denominator of the sense of the language of necessity. There's something greater than the self driving me here that's taking me forward no matter what. You know, I remember being asked once about funding. Well, what will you do if you don't get the funding? And thinking, well, I just keep on going. I don't know. You know, I just, I do. I've spent a long time without funding. Thankfully, my funding now flows in beautifully. But that sense of, you know, I just can't stop. I can't not do this. It occurred to me very early on when I proposed a, an international law of ecocide into the United Nations that this was absolutely huge. That by creating a legal uh, mechanism that creates a legal duty of care that overrides all other laws, that criminalizes mass damage and destruction, is going to have a huge ripple effect right across the world and right across future generations into, I don't know, however far we can look, infinity and further. It's going to radically take humanity on another path. That this is massive, it's absolutely huge. And very early on, I actually made myself incredibly sick over the enormity of it. In fact, I spent a month vomiting <laughs> um, because I would literally wake up feeling sick to the pit of my stomach. This is so big. What am I going to do here? I, I can't possibly meet the enormity of it. And in fact, very early on, I went in to see uh, one uh, NGO in London, British NGO, and being told by the head of that NGO, uh, from the British office, you know, Polly, this is way too big for us to deal with. And thinking, OK, fine, I'll just get back to my laptop then and keep on going with it. <laughs> and that sense of, yeah, it is, it's huge. So how do I meet the enormity of it? And it got to the end of that month and I thought, you know what, Polly, this is a waste of time. You're, just, you're literally making your sick, yourself sick over it. Just let it go. Let go of the whole drama of it and the stress of it. There's something that's holding me back here and it's in my head, you know? And if I let that go, then maybe that'll just give me the freedom to move forward in whatever way I can. And it was at that moment I decided, in fact, the only way I can take this forward is to take it forward in really unconventional ways. If I go down that conventional route, it's just not going to work. And that was really freeing for me. Uh, because I didn't want to enter into what I saw as a system that was so entrenched in slow thinking and f so much fear of, you know, fear of taking the quantum leap here, that it seemed to me that going in within the system, as Charles said, to become a, a UN special rapporteur or end up sitting on a working group somewhere, it just was never going to be enough. It, it's, you know, this was too big to just try and take it through those normal channels. 
but where to go instead? And it really was one of these things of, I have no idea. Where on earth do you go with a really big idea like this? Well, you know things happened really, really fast. Within a week of submitting into the United Nations a fully worked out proposal for a law of ecocide, the Guardian got in touch and said, hey, Polly, we've heard about this. We want to write about it. And Juliet, uh, Juliet Jarrett, and we ended up meeting. She said, look, Polly, this is so big. You need a website. People will want to know more about it. And I thought, yeah, actually, there's something about the visibility of it. Just submitting into the UN Law Commission a fully worked up proposal, wearing my hat as a lawyer, is not enough. There's something about actually the visibility aspect. How do I make this visible? Getting that up and out there. So yeah, sure, we agreed we'd get a, a website up in a week. This is going to go out a week on Friday. Well, the next day she phoned me. She said, actually, Polly, we're putting it out today. <laughs> It just so happened I had my website guy there and literally as we were putting up the website, putting up Facebook and putting up Twitter and such like, we saw this going all over the world really, really fast. It, it just took off woof, right across the world very, very quickly. And I think this sometimes happens when an idea whose time has come, it, it, it has an energy behind it and it just goes shoo, right across the world. And it, it really changed everything very, very fast for me. And it's invited in engagement from lots of different quarters right across the world. And the most unlikely alliances as well. And I really like that. I, I actively court the unlikely alliances. The, the conversations that are least expected are sometimes the most fruitful ones of all. And I, I've, I've come to learn that it really is that thing of never judge a book by its cover. That you know, the most nuttiest, randomest person can be the most fantastic person for taking it forward. And I'll give you an example. I, I actually advised into the UN negotiations for three years, I uh, just uh, kind of around this period, two, 2009, 10, and 11. And when I was in Durban, I met uh, a member of the youth delegation. I think he was from the Philippines. And he got really excited about this law of ecocide. It really inspired him in a massive way. And he really wanted to take it forward. And what I discovered was, you know, he was just kind of firing off in all different directions. And I thought, well, yeah, that's great, that's cool, you know, whatever. And what I suddenly discovered was that the youth delegation had chosen him to go and meet all these top leaders, uh, to go and speak to them. He had five minutes with each one to talk to them about what they were doing. Well, he didn't, and they filmed it. He didn't. He would sit down and say, what are you going to do about a law of ecocide? And they'd all go, huh? What are you talking about? <laughs> and he'd just go, Rrr! and he'd, he'd get these people who were in very influential positions that you know, I was really keen to get to, and suddenly the job was done. You know, he was seeding it in really, really fast. And there was one interview, and I watched this with complete amazement, because he'd get the detail a bit wrong, but it didn't matter. You know, it kind of got the overall picture. And they were so stunned, you know, who is this young guy, you know, saying, hey, you, you're in a position of strong influence, you've got to do something. And he had one of these, I don't know, UN officials saying to him, you know, but what about the detail of this? You've you, you got to tell me the detail. And he said, hey, man, that's not my job. That's yours. <laughs> and he completely turned it around on them because he didn't know the detail. And I really learned from that. It was just kind of, you know, yeah, yeah, these guys, you're in charge, all right. You, you go doing your homework on it. And this was so fantastic for me because suddenly I kind of, you know, it really opened me up to, you know, the realm of potential of, of the most unusual circumstances allowing this to be seeded in a very fast and very quick way. And actually, through him, I ended up meeting some remarkable indigenous leaders as a result. He, he got to talk to everyone. This guy was just like a one-man band. He was on a roll in a big way. He was very good fun. Um, and I even saw him... <laughs> I, when we were coming through the airport, he didn't have a visa, and he completely, completely, 
I don't know how to put it politely, bullshitted his way through it and said, I'm with her, you know, I was like, oh, no. But, you know, he certainly was with me, actually, by the end of it. It was just phenomenal. I mean, the, the fantasticness of it. And I really learned from him because, actually, this was one thing I did in the climate negotiations because I wasn't there in an official capacity, but I was legally advising in at certain levels. And what I, what I suddenly realised was actually, you know what, if I can get a press pass, that gets me in very fast to lots of people. So I managed to get hold of a press pass and basically gate crashed an awful lot of stuff. And I would think, OK, this guy I really want to talk to. He's got a strong moral radar. And once the, the talk, the high level talk with all these dignitaries, or whatever was going on, I'd follow out the door, I'd flash my fake, normally, <laughs> press pass, and I'd zoot out and I'd go and say, well, actually, I'm not really here to interview you, but I'd like to talk about something that I think you'd care to hear about. And this gave me huge access very, very fast, very quickly. And I, you know, sometimes it's just the window of opportunity, knowing and seeing it and saying, OK, there's my window of opportunity to step through it and see what happens. And somehow these windows of opportunity open up. And it, it takes a bit of, you know, stepping out of my comfort zone to say, OK, I'll just reason my way through and see what happens here. But it's never been a problem somehow, you know, for that to happen. Or just life suddenly, magically, you know, things do happen around it. But maybe I should say a little bit about law of ecocide. I, for those of you who don't really know about it, what I did was I, I gave legal definition to the word ecocide. So I've legally defined it as the extensive damage, destruction to or loss of ecosystems of a given territory. There are two types of ecocide. There's human caused ecocide. So you can look at, for instance, the Athabasca tar sands or the Amazon and say, OK, that mass damage and destruction there is, is human caused. It's actually, it's largely, it's corporate activity. There's another type of ecocide, though. That's naturally occurring ecocide. Rising sea levels, tsunamis, melting ice. Anything that leaves uh, a territory at risk of significant harm. Catastrophic events. Now, how do these two tie in together? How can you create you know, a legal duty of care here? Yes, you can prosecute, not sue, but prosecute for corporate ecocide. You can actually take a CEO of a court and hold him to account in a criminal court of law for decisions that are made at the top end that have significant adverse impact on many millions below, and not just humans. But what about prosecuting someone for the rising sea levels or the melting ice? Well, that's actually a far more involved process. You, you can't say because of what BP is doing up in the Athabasca tar sands, therefore there's a direct causal link in law that means you can prosecute for the Maldives and 54 small island states going underwater. But we do know there is a correlation. It's too tenuous in law. However, by creating a legal duty of care at the very top end, and the principles known as the principle of superior responsibility, it attaches itself not just to CEOs and directors, it also attaches itself to ministers of state, heads of state, heads of banks. And this is very important when you're looking at the small island states going underwater, it creates a legal duty of care to give assistance preemptively, so that actually with 54 small island states at risk of going underwater, all those nations have to come together and work out how to give assistance. And it's not a matter of just putting everyone in a boat and saying, get away, we don't have enough land here in Australia. Off you go to somewhere else. Because with a legal duty of care, you are required to come together and work out. And we're talking about mass relocation, environmental refugee issues here. We're talking about land that's required here. What are we going to do here? This is, this is an enormous problem. And this is just not being discussed openly at, in the climate negotiations. And in fact, 2011 was my last year because I realised that this was a system that was just a waste of time completely. 
I, the, the, the really important conversations were being ignored. You know, the Philippines, the Maldives saying, look, you know, we're going to go underwater. What happens when we have a tsunami? And everyone's saying, hey, that's awful. But hey, anyway, nothing to do with me. Because actually, in legal terms, that means I do not have a legal duty of care. I don't have to do anything. And this is a real problem that we have, that at the moment, we're just not having the important conversation. Climate negotiations, if you like, has just become a trading house to see who has the rights over, quite literally, hot air. The trading rights. It's just one big trading mechanism, market mechanism. And that's not going to the source of the problem. It's not actually going to the very heart of it and saying, OK, what are we going to do when there's mass damage and destruction here? What can we do to significantly abate this from the outset? How can we actually identify the true source of this? So a law of ecocide is really going to the very source, upstream, if you like, and turning off the tap over here. So no longer is the flow of energy, if you like, and one form of energy is money, going into, we'll, we'll no longer will it go into corporate activity that's causing significant harm. You're literally turning off the tap. But that also allows that energy to flow into innovation in the other direction, required legally, so that governments are required by law to help support and create the enabling conditions for the innovation in the other direction to flourish, for the green economy to flourish. And this is really about creating resilient economies. This is about creating jobs. But it's coming from an overriding principle of first do no harm. That's really what is governing this, if you like. And underpinning that, for me, are three core values that really govern me as much as this law. And this law, I think, was born of me really identifying those governing values for me. Three values that for me make sense that in this wider world, how I'm trying to make sense of this world. The interconnectedness of all life. The very sacredness of life, that life itself is sacred. And the third one, the love of life. For me, this is driven by a huge amount of love for people and planet. It's not hatred against companies. It's not hatred against governments. It's the love that drives me forward more than anything else. I really mean that. I love this earth. And for me, it is utterly untenable that we keep on destroying it. There gets a point when we say, enough, no more. We don't go there. And we did it with genocide. We got to a point where civilization said, enough, no more. We don't go there. And we draw a line in the sand and we criminalize it. Wouldn't it be bizarre if we didn't have a crime of genocide in place? You would think this quite strange. And yet, prior to 1948, genocide wasn't a crime. In fact, some countries had laws in place to make it entirely lawful to do that. Now we would think that utterly untenable. Now, that's not to say we haven't gotten rid of genocide entirely, but we have a law of theft, and we haven't stopped theft entirely either. But what we are doing is we're using law, and criminal law especially, is when we take a moral intent and we make it into a legal intent. We, we have a phrase, uh, an ancient Latin phrase in law, when malum in se becomes malum prohibita, when something so wrong in and of itself, we prohibit it. We draw the line in the sand, we say, no go, we don't go there now. And if you choose to, then you are held to account in a criminal court of law. An example I would like to show you how it works is I, how we deal with significant harm on a human level. And I, I, this really uh, is something that I'm, I'm kind of exploring even more, more deeply just now. But I think it parallels it very well. If we look at child abuse, 
you know, what price do we put on child abuse? Well, we don't. We don't price tag it. But if we look at earth abuse, we do. We put a price tag on it and say, okay, it comes at a price. We give it you know, a, a costing analysis. We talk about ecosystem services. We don't talk about child services. You know, what service does that child give us? Or that other human? So in criminal law, when we have significant harm playing out, not just to children, but to humans, we don't put a price on it. We say it's wrong, legally it's wrong, and we, we criminalize it. You know, if someone was to smash a bottle over your head, that could be grievous bodily harm. If someone was to sexually abuse a child, you know, that's a criminal wrong. We don't turn around and say, okay, that costs you 50 quid, don't do it again. But when a company goes in and abuses a huge tract of land, desecrates it, leaves it dead. And I, I've flown over old oil fields in Alaska that date back to the 1970s, and that land is still dead land. Nobody's doing anything about it. In fact, it's so big, you don't even know where to start. So this is the thing. Significant harm playing out, it's catch me if you can. Illegal logging, well, yes, if they're caught maybe 100 times, that's factored in as an externality, just pay the price, the fine, or maybe actually even better, why don't we just close down the company and reopen another one tomorrow under another name? So really it's catch me, in, catch me if you can laws to put a price tag on it. And this to me, when I, when I saw that, you know, really there's missing law here that's required. A law of ecocide is missing law. Because for me, there's a spectrum of harm at play here. I, what I call a spectrum of harm that we're not managing to address with existing law. Existing law works from the voluntary at one end and at the other end is where I'm coming from is actually the pro prohibition, the criminalization of it to give it enforcement, to give it legal teeth. And in between you have protocols, you have treaties, you have um, conventions, none of which have legal teeth, just a lot of nice words written down, which increasingly governments are not upholding. A very good example of that is the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Britain is a signatory to that. And yet we're busy proliferating nuclear weapons. In fact, we even have annually a weapons and arms fair in London. Quite open about it, it's covered in the news. We breach that treaty all the time. There's big business to be made in this country, and not just this country, Norway as well, and they're, they're a signatory. And yet weapons are being made every day. Because it's not a crime. It's not a crime. So no one can be held to account for it. So this is, this is really powerful, that actually we get to that point of saying, enough, this must stop. When I was in Australia uh, a month or so ago, I heard about Tony Abbott has just signed off, Prime Minister, he's just signed off given licence for the first mega mine, which is, I don't know, 100 times larger than the normal size for mining that's going to happen so that coal can be extracted to ship over to China. And the fastest, quickest way to do that is going to be across the Barrier Reef. So there's going to be dredging up right through the Barrier Reef so that these mega ships that are a mile long can come in and out. Now the Barrier Reef is of course a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And Tony Abbott had this pointed out to him. He said, yeah, well, well it's not a crime. He's right, it's not. It's not a crime. He knows that. So he can't be held to account for that. But actually, it is a crime. Morally, it's a crime. Morally, this is a crime. And it's just a matter of time before it becomes legally a crime. So for me, this is about how we claim name and frame. How do we claim this space? 
and actually make the narrative around it our own? How do we give it name? This is very important to you, you know, to actually say, this is our earth, this is our, you know, it, this is a global commons and truth. The whole idea of property and ownership, that's just been dreamt up by a bunch of lawyers anyway. <laughs> but there's something bigger here at play. You know, we're, we're being invited to stand up and speak out and really claim that space and say, this is, this is our territory, this is our land, we can't let this happen, this is untenable. And if you destroy this, give it name, you know, this is going to be an ecocide. This should be a crime. But it's not coming from a place of protest. It's not about being a protester. It's about actually standing up as a protector, if you like. It's about becoming a voice for the earth. It's about standing up, speaking out on behalf of the earth. And now more than ever, the earth is really requiring, really calling on us to do this. Now, in my conscience, I can't square it to just sit back and do nothing about this. And I'm seeing every day more and more damage and destruction and the threat of it looming over the horizon in many countries, including this country now as well. But by reframing, by framing the narrative from a place of deep care, <coughs> something shifts quite radically because we're talking about a greater freedom, a freedom that comes from a first do no harm principle. And that is a greater freedom for humanity and the earth and for future generations. There is no freedom in continuing with mass damage and destruction. Of course there's not. Destroy that very earth, then we suffer too and future generations. And the, the land itself, the sea itself suffers. But there's a spectrum of harm here that's playing out where it depends where you are in that spectrum as to whether or not you engage with this, the idea that we create laws that bring it to an end. And it depends on whether or not you're in that space of care, deep care, I call it, or, or whether or not you're in that space of deep disconnect. And I do see it as a spectrum, deep disconnect over here, deep care over here. And we can move, we can move within the spectrum, you know, depending on what the issue is, depending on, you know, a number of different factors. And that's good because actually people can move, you know, from there to a place of caring more deeply. But something happens when you're in that space of deep disconnect, where you can make decisions that are going to cause significant harm that will play out not just here and now, but in future generations, and be really quite blind to it. And for me, this, this is where corruption comes in. And I use that word informally, corruption, cure, the heart. It's the rupturing of the heart space. Because this is the thing, when you're in that space of deep care, it comes from the heart. A legal duty of care speaks of trusteeship, guardianship, stewardship, looking seven generations hence and further forward again. But that place of deep disconnect is a real numbing out. It allows you to make decisions without, without facing the consequences, without wanting to even look at the consequences. There's a kind of almost a willful blindness I don't know if willful is the right word, but it's, it's that not wanting to look. It's almost sometimes too big to look at it. It's too painful. But what I see playing out is that a law of ecocide gives us the potential to really move so many more people over from that place of disconnect into deep care. It creates the enabling conditions for those who are really stuck in systems that are so dependent whether or not we're talking economic, political, legal systems that are so dependent on the existing machinery staying in place. And I see it time and time again, good people stuck in a system that's, that's not working. It's, it's like those rats on wheels. It's just going round and round and round and round. It's not moving anywhere. It's just continuing. And actually, it's a spiral of harm. It's a cycle of harm, if you like. And that's the thing. Mass damage and destruction, which I call ecocide, leads to 
resource depletion, amongst other things, which leads to conflict, which leads to harm, which leads to war, which leads to more mass damage and destruction, more resource depletion, more conflict, more war, and it spirals onwards and down, down, down. We literally go to war over the last remaining resources. But maybe this is also about how we're at war with ourselves. And one of the things we're exploring in the course is, and we're going to be dipping in starting tomorrow, about what is our inner ecocide? What are our cycles of harm here that are playing out? And how can we break them? It's not a matter of doing a little less, but how can we really break that and say, enough, no more? This must end. I've had enough. I'm not going to let that happen. I was voted <laughs> to be one of the most unreasonable people in the world by a magazine in America, and I'm very proud of that. <laughs> I, th I think that's a great, great thing to be voted to be. I, and I really got it, because reasonable people stay with what is. You know, the reasonable person, and you know, I, I've met very reasonable people in the world who say, Polly, you've got to be reasonable about this. <laughs> you know, this is, this is the reality of what is. Um, you're never going to get this law of ecocide. You know, you, you've got to be reasonable. Go, go into the UN process and, you know, maybe you get something in a document. No, I'm not having that. That's, that's a waste of time. And this is the thing. I love people who do permaculture because they're so unreasonable <laughs> about life. You know, they say, I've had enough. I'm not going to eat these vegetables that are sprayed with chemicals. I'm not having it. I don't want something turning up in a plastic bag in a supermarket. I'm going to grow my own. And I'm going to make sure that, you know, that actually they really are grown with great love and care. And, they, they, you know, they're so fundamentally unreasonable. They just refuse to accept the normative the what is, you know, what, what the mainstream world is engaging with around food. They just go, no, I'm not having it. No, I'm not going to step into that supermarket again. And that is that fundamental unreasonability that comes through that really drives something very different into, its, in, into that space instead. In fact, if anything, what you're doing is you're creating a space you know, by saying no to something, well, it opens up a space. And nature does this. You know, I think, in a way, the whole emergence of Earth law is us trying to make sense of natural law, if you like. But nature does this, that once you create an empty space, it allows it to be filled by something else. You know, if you were to take a bottle of wine that's you know, full of chemicals, I and pesticides and what have you. There's no way that you can get a biodynamic wine into that bottle until you've poured out the contents so that there's space for something else to go in there. And I, I think this kind of happens psychologically as well, and it happens out in a larger scale as well, that there is this thing of saying, I refuse to accept the contents. I'm not doing that anymore. You know, boom, it's going to go. I'm not going to let that into my body. So I invite in something else instead. And I'm going to take <coughs> charge of what that is. And in a way, this also plays into new laws as well. Because it is saying, enough, no more. This whole body of what we call environmental law, it's not fit for purpose. It can't be, because it's quite obviously not working. It's all based on fines anyway, or permit allocation. Permit allocation doesn't work either. You know. What do you do? You say, OK, you limit your emissions to this level, so I give you a permit. Oh, you're exponentially growing your business. OK, I'll give you another permit. Another, and another, and another. And before you know it, those emissions have escalated. So actually, permit allocation escalates the problem rather than reduces it. And there is this thing of just kind of playing into the, the niceness of it. Well, you know, if we do a little less, no, it's not about doing a little less. That's that cycle of harm, just a bit slower, playing out. It really is about saying, OK, how do I break this cycle of harm? Say, enough, no more, this is it, we stop it. And I think this is what a law of ecocide really is. It's, it's the catalyst for enormous change right across the board. It cuts through everything and says, OK, now we put this in as an overriding 
law, an international crime against peace, all international crimes against peace, they act like umbrella laws. You cannot write laws around them to avoid genocide. You cannot write bits of legislation and say, OK, Britain now can sidestep genocide so that we can get rid of those pesky people in Totnes. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing too much, you know. A new pound idea, you know. Uh, their own brewing stuff, mycelium mushrooms, oh my goodness. <laughs> so this is the wonderful thing because actually it creates the enabling conditions for politicians actually to do the right thing at the very top end. It suddenly becomes far easier for an energy minister to turn around to a company that wants to continue on with unconventional extraction of some sort and say, look, I can't give you a license for that because that really is destructive and we have to look to the cumul cumulative impact and uh, that's a risk of becoming an ecocide. So I'm terribly sorry but we're going to have to outlaw that. However, you're an energy company and we'll give you subsidies to create the innovation in the other direction. But the beauty is all that pressure is taken off that minister's shoulders because he can say, I'm really sorry I can't do anything about it because it's an international law and you know, hey, I could be held to account in a criminal court of law if I was to be complicit in this playing out as an ecocide if I grant you the licence. So I'm not going to do that. It's very powerful. It can actually create the, the kind of legal mechanism. It's almost like, you know, it gives you the, 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 you know, the rod to, to lean on, if you like. It gives you the justification for saying, no, we can't go there. But it, it's more than that. It goes far deeper than that. It gives the freedom to say, hey, let's do the thing that works, that doesn't cause harm. And that's really, really powerful in its own right, because that's a very different narrative. You know, Charles talks about changing the story here. You know, how do we change the story and how do we speak from the heart? How do we actually, you know, politics, if you look at the, the dialogue around politics, particularly in this country at the moment, I see no greatness. I'm not, you know, we used to hear of those wonderful great speeches that would happen. And I've, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time looking at, you know, the great speeches of the world. And, and over time, how this changes, we have a far more conversational way of engaging people now. We're not the kind of Winston Churchill years anymore. Uh, where it's kind of slow and ponderous. And, you know, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream was so much of its time. But where, where's the great statesman speeches? It's not happening, really, because, in fact, we have so many people in positions of power who have so much fear around what they're doing that they, didn't, they don't dare stand up and speak out for something far greater than the self. That's a really big conversation to have. And in fact, I was talking with Charles on the train coming down here. I was saying, I really am outing myself here, oh my goodness. I was saying I actually don't want to vote anymore. What I'm seeing playing out in politics, I, I'm so disillusioned by it that it's the system itself that seems to be going so wrong. I'm actually looking for something far greater to emerge there, and something that's far more decentralised, far more community-based, far more societally based. Not democracy, but maybe sociocracy. That is a word that does exist out there, uh, and it's suddenly coming back into being again. It's kind of taking on its own life. That there's something else. I don't know quite what, but sometimes it really helps to be able to say, well, whatever it is, I don't know, but I do know I don't want that. It doesn't seem to be working. And maybe that allows that space to open up then for something else to emerge. And to, the, to actually have that conversation. So getting back to daring to be great. For me, it's also about allowing myself to be a vessel, if you like, to allow something bigger than the self come through here. I'm just a messenger. Um, and I know that because, in fact, the law of ecocide has been around for a very long time. I didn't know that when I first proposed it. 
When I first proposed it into the United Nations back in 2010, I actually thought that I'd made up the name itself. And I, I've subsequently discovered, uh, thanks in part to the University of London, we've now uncovered documents going back into the 1940s when the drafting of genocide was being put in place. Ecocide was actually in the original drafts as well. But that helps to know that. There's a kind of a history here. And in fact, one of the beautiful things that, by taking an unconventional approach to all of this, and one of the things I'm doing is I'm open sourcing everything that I'm doing. It's out there on the internet. You can download a whole load of stuff on it. So there's a YouTube channel where you can download um, PowerPoints, they're not always powerless and pointless. <laughs> um, videos, uh, information, documents, the documents that have been submitted into governments. Every single government in the world has received a concept paper. Over the last two years, I've been invited in to legally advise 54 governments, either at a UN level or ministerial level or senior legal advisor level. And by open sourcing this, I really am inviting everyone to engage in this. Everyone becomes my extended team. It's an invitation for you to engage in this in whatever way works for you. There's a big page on what you can do, but actually in a way what I'm doing is I'm inviting you, if this makes your heart sing, to engage in this in whatever way works best for you. And that can be in many millions and millions of ways. I have someone that took a TED talk and she remixed it and put music on it. It's great. You know, I have someone that's, that's writing letters all over the place. I have a woman in Wales who's in her 80s who just gets out there and goes into meetings and she goes into the general the, the assembly in, in Wales and they start asking questions about governmental corruption and climate change. She says, well, what about the law of ecocide? Here I've got leaflets and she starts handing them out. And then she's just going from village to village in Wales. I just, I just got an email from someone else the other day saying, hey, Dan has just been in Lampeter. She's just literally getting out there. And you know, it's kind of like the abolition of slavery. In fact, there are huge parallels playing out here with the abolition of slavery. I've read an awful lot into the abolition of slavery because I thought this is really exciting. You know, that was a time in history of civilization when we had really a, a collective shift in consciousness really shifted in a big way there. And also something happened that wasn't a branded campaign. There wasn't an NGO driving something forward. It, it was a bunch of people and then some and then some and then many others as well. And something remarkable happened there. William Wilberforce, who was one of the main people involved in that, and he really her her heard that calling. There was a calling there. there was a, he, you know, his writing and his spoken word, it really speaks of that language of necessity to get out there and do something. And I remember reading about how he really wrestled within himself as to whether or not to take this on because it was so enormous. And he actually sat underneath an oak tree famously to work out what to do. And he kind of had a conversation with the tree, actually. And from that kind of inner dialogue, he made the commitment to do whatever it took within his lifetime to make it happen, to abolish slavery, the abolition of slavery, to gift his life to that. And the wonderful thing was, two days before he died, the last main law that needed to be put in place was put in place and that sent ripples right across the world so he died a happy man and you know he didn't have facebook or google, google <laughs> like we do but what was so interesting at that time was that there were three main arguments put i uh, by big industry then i uh, to say why we should keep slavery in place big industry said it's a necessity they said the public demand it and if we get rid of it, it will lead to economic collapse. What does big industry say today about getting rid of fossil fuels? You know, big industry that's really causing huge corporate ecocide. It's a necessity, public demanded. It will lead to economic collapse. Same arguments are put. 
Well, you know, they didn't stack up with the abolition of slavery. And in fact, actually, not one of those companies that was directly or indirectly involved with slavery, the, not just the, the shipping of slaves, but also the, the facilitation of slaves into the, the sugar plantations, the first ever monocrop plantations. But not one of those companies actually collapsed. And that's because... In fact, there was a transition period given. The enabling conditions were given so that they could turn around, they could come out of that, and they could transition into trading in tea in China. Some of them actually became the policers of the seas. So poacher turned gamekeeper, if you like. But what was so interesting was that when that moment came, it came very fast. And this is what happens when change comes. It can come very, very quickly. And there comes a point. It looks kind of like chaos that's happening all around, but somehow it gets to a point where it kind of crystallizes and everything comes together. And it wasn't, of course, just William Wilberforce speaking. You know, there, was, there was a guy that got on his horse and went town to town to town, rather like Diana and Wales. <laughs> She's doing and many others in many other countries that are just kind of taking this out. I have someone in, who's walking right across Canada, going into indigenous community by indigenous community, speaking as one indigenous person to another, taking in the law of ecocide, and overcoming the hurdles of the questions that are asked here about it, overcoming the biggest hurdle she meets, oh, that's a white man's idea, and saying, no, this is a law that can unify us all. In fact, it can really help give enforcement to your rights, to indigenous rights, to their land and what happens to that land. So it's very powerful what she's doing there. And she walks in minus 30 degrees. So she's a remarkable woman. That's really about stepping out of my comfort zone. I couldn't do that. That is truly greatness, without a doubt. But here's the thing, she's been doing that for three years and she hasn't stopped once. She just gets out there and she does it and she does it and she does it. And I have huge admiration for Raven for doing this. And I can tell you many other stories of people who are doing this in different ways as well. But something about this idea creates inspiration for others to take it forward. And I really am inviting others to do this. And that really speaks of greatness in itself, to take it and to seed it and to seed it and put trust that this is something that will get to a certain point, rather like the abolition of slavery, when more and more people start speaking out. And there's such a growing momentum that you've created a collective intent that it can only but come to an end. It gets to a point where, boom, something shifts and suddenly that point and that moment comes and it moves. Now, it just so happens that I think civilization is ready for this now, <laughs> not 20, 40, 50 years on from now. I think we are at that point of emergency right now. And remember, emergency is just a state of emergence. It's a point where something can come through and emerge, something new. And when that does, you know, the rules of the game change dramatically. Old rules no longer apply. It, it allows us to really step in and claim that space, give it name, frame the narrative, take charge, if you like, energetically as well as physically and practically, take charge of where this will go next and how we take it forward. But I think that it requires greatness to do that. And every leader that I've met, really what I'm doing is I'm inviting them to dare to be great. But I'm not just talking about leaders who are in, in, in governments. I'm talking about the leader within each and every single one of us. We can lead on this. We can take this forward. Because this is a legacy issue. What we choose to do in our lifetime, at this time, can change the history of civilization here on in. And that is truly great, of that I am sure. So I'm inviting all of you to dare to be great. And it's an invitation to stand up. 
if you will. And we're going to do just a little bit of fun. <laughs> and for the students who are here, this just serves to reinforce what we did yesterday. What it is, is, is an opportunity to step into this space. Um, I'm aware we've kind of got chairs around us and what have you. But movement, movement helps here. So if, if, if you get a chance to kind of move or if there's a way of even just stepping to the side of where you are, it's kind of nice to just be able to have movement or move the chairs. Because what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you to step forward or step to the side and step into your greatness. Physically step into it. And as you do, you know, say, I dare to be great. And step into it. And take a, take a few moments to really feel what that is, to really sense it, to really experience it, to visualize it. I don't know, something may come to you that you see, you hear, you sense, but it's really about embodying this, feeling it within you. And just taking a moment, maybe closing your eyes, feeling what that is, and then when you're ready, to, to step back and sit down. So are we all up for doing this? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to say one, two, three, and that's your moment to step. Step into your greatness, and as you step, to say, I dare to be great. You know, and give it voice. You know, feel it coming from your belly. I dare to be great. Yeah, get out. You know, feel it big. Okay. So, you all ready? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Okay. One, two, three. I dare to be great. <laughs> And when you're ready, step back and sit down. But take with you that feeling, because it's always with you now. It's there. It's embodied within you. And I have to warn you, this will change your life. <laughs> this will change your life. But I guarantee you've just invited yourself into the adventure of life in the fullest of senses. Absolutely. So please do enjoy it wherever it takes you. Thank you very much.